The following presentation is part of the Technology and the Corporation Conference Series, sponsored by MIT's Industrial Liaison Program. I think it's 50 years ago, I walked onto this campus for the first time, a brash young PhD from Northwestern, OR statistics with specialty in marketing. I was really impressed with MIT. Uh, how many of you are on MIT campus for the first time? Quite a few. So uh, you may come away with the same reaction I did. Well, I, I was applying for an assistant professor job, and one of the senior faculty in marketing at the end of the day after the interview said, well, you know, we really need somebody. Uh, we're going to make you an offer, but you probably won't make it here. And I thought that was quite a unique marketing uh, strategy. So I said to him, well, there are two ways I'm going to leave MIT. One's you're going to ask me to leave. The second is I'm going to stop learning. And they haven't asked me to leave, and I'm still learning. So uh, this is really a great, uh, great institution to be at. Well, uh, what I'd like to do today, since it is 50 years, is kind of review what I think is a very exciting period in marketing of the changes in consumer dynamics, and particularly an area where I specialize in marketing analytics. How did we respond to these changes, creating new methods, new data, moving from the early uh, 70s on to where we are in, in 2016? So I want to review the last five decades, big changes in dynamics and analytics. Then I want to give you two examples of state-of-the-art work I'm involved with now. And these are both machine learning AI deep learning applications in marketing. One is morphing ads, where you modify an ad that you're serving or a website to match the individual cognitive style of your customer. And that builds trust, it builds consideration, and more sales. And the second is the use of deep learning on large data sets, click data sets, to try to identify opportunities for new products. So these are really edge of the state of the art, kind of an idea of what's going on in some of the analytics here. And I want to close our final uh, session uh, minutes at the end here by having a look at the next 10 years. So I'd encourage you, while you're on pigeonhole, not only questions, but think about what are going to be the big changes that are going to drive consumer dynamics in the next 10 years? And how are we going to create the tools to allow us to deal with those kinds of new changes? So those three things. So first, let's start uh, with some of the decades. Uh, way back 1976. This is the prime time of TV, big power brands, products of soaring 60s, uh, lots of abundance, uh, lots of new products. Everybody's creating new products and, and lots of failure of new products. So what happened over on the analytics side at that point? Well, this was really the start of computers and marketing. And I have to go back to kind of a, a story of what it was like. Uh, when I did my thesis of simulating a new product market, my program was written on punch cards. These were like eight inches by four inches, and little punches across the top entered the code from one line of code. So you had to go on a machine and punch them, and then you went on another machine to validate them, and you carried boxes of program code to the batch processor. And if you had data, you may have carried even more boxes or sometimes a big magnetic tape. Then that batch computer turned away, and of course it had huge memory, 64K. And you know, we were struggling with trying to, to get our data back down to that size to get things done. But that computer enabled us to develop the field of marketing science. So back in the early 60s uh, onto the 70s, we had operations research, modeling, algorithms, math programming coming into marketing, trying to help companies, in this case, optimize their profit because they were in control. They had they had the power. So what do we do with advertising? What do we do with, with promotion? Uh, one of the models developed here by John Little was called BrandAid. And uh, as Tony said, we just finished a memoir book on John Little, which was Little's Law of Queuing plus his marketing work. Additionally, we had things like Assessor, which were pre-test market simulations of new products, which turned out to be a good way to, to simulate and measure how consumers would respond before market, and a lot of models of switching behavior. But the next decade, as we evolved in, we saw kind of the culmination of this brand power. Brand loyalty was a really big uh, phenomenon, a major breakthrough in UPC data, probably the first time we had really supermarket data I remember when I came in the 60s, we would look at Nielsen data. It would be hand by monthly reports. 
tabs of paper, big stacks of paper. Finally, now in the 70s, the 80s, we started to get UPC data, the ability to get real time, very fast market shares and response. And of course, this is a time brands are really in power. It was brand to retailer, brand to consumer driving the profit function. And over on the analytics side, we developed some new models, logit models, which predicted choice as a function of advertising, promotion, and competition. Conjoint analysis became very popular, where we looked at attributes by giving customers trade-offs and estimating those attribute importances so we could create new product combinations. This is the era of the initial decision support systems, information, data, models, and display. And we were starting to get better displays for what was going on. And in addition, big breakthroughs in econometrics, uh, particularly simultaneous equation systems. So quite a bit going on in those two first decades. But probably one of the major changes that really disrupted uh, marketing is in that 80s and 90s period with the internet. Because this not only provided a new technology to interact with customers, it changed the power relationship. Suddenly, customers had power. They had information. They could walk into an auto dealership and know the retail prices, the suggested prices. They could get bids from other people. They could make comparisons. Uh, just to indicate how strong that paradigm shift was, I've, back in 1988 or 89, I was in a meeting at GM with managers, and we were showing how on the internet you could get uh, not just the manufacturer's suggested price, but the invoice price and the margin. And somebody in the back of the room raised their hand and said, we got to stop this. <laughs> we can't let customers have our cost information. Well, hello, you know, this is the new power relationship. And suddenly we move from brand pushing power down to customers to customers having an active role and brands saying, well, we have to create trust. We need to earn the trust of our customers so they will give us their business. And we have to have not a manipulative push, a little lipstick on this pig, but rather a real genuine value proposition for the customer. And on the side of analytics, then, of course, we had uh, customer relationship management systems. We were tracking uh, responses and individual behavior, understanding the trust determinants, not only privacy, but do people believe us? Do they have confidence in us? Do they understand we're competent? And most important, do they understand that we're benevolent? We're working on their behalf as well as our profit behalf. In the analytics for new products, we created here at MIT something called information acceleration, where we simulated the future for, for example, new cars and new durables with new technology, uh, multimedia simulations of the future, put people in that future, measured their responses, and looked at the forecast and new product implications. Decision support systems had evolved now to what have become known and probably used in your companies as dashboards, where brand managers have full display of what's going on by region, by brand, maybe even by SKU, by promotion. So it was a big influx of tools for brand managers. Now, as we move on into the 90s and into the 2000s, of course, we have search engines, Google dominance coming on the market, Amazon reaching its prominence, eBay and big data driving a lot of the customer dynamics. And over on our side of analytics, of course, we now have a toolkit. So we can do A-B testing. We can do conversion modeling. We can track people's individual behaviors. And a big new uh, tool for marketers was targeting individually ads, whether that be uh, a banner ad or through your search and web pages. Another area was developing at this time in, in economics, but not the traditional maximized utility, but rather behavioral economics. People may not actually just optimize. They have a, a lot of psychological phenomena. Behavioral science becomes a major tool for marketing as well as economics and OR statistics. So here we are now up to our current uh, generation. And you know, social media is new and dominant. I mean, who would have? suspected Facebook would come out of an Harvard MIT student project and become the dominant uh, social media of, of our today. YouTube serves videos, now billions of YouTube views per day. Uh, mobile, everybody has it everywhere in the world. I was in India uh, recently and looking out in a 
rural town I was in, and there was a man plowing with his, with his oxen. I thought, isn't that quaint? And he stopped, reached in his pocket, and took out his cell phone. Now, I don't know if he was checking shopping or what he was doing. He was probably talking to some of his neighbors. But it was just so striking that you know, we are in a place where this is ubiquitous now. And mobile is the way we do social media. And now we have customers talking to customers without brands in the process. And customers drive the process. If you think you've got much brand power anymore, you're probably wrong. The customer has the power. And you can't keep secrets from the customers. You can't hide anything. Everything you do will be out there. And sometimes it'll be true, and sometimes it'll be false. So it raises a lot of new challenges. So a lot of new analytics are needed. Uh, a lot of market experimentation, A-B testing. We suddenly can do A-B testing where we look at click-through rates and conversions. We don't have to just do a research and imply what people might do. We can actually do real-time market experiments. And we can do behavioral experiments. And you'll hear today a range of behavioral experiments. Uh, my colleague Renee Gosling will talk about some behavioral experiments, social psychology experiments around storytelling and how storytelling works with the consumer, between consumers, and how a brand can be part of that process. So it's B to C to B to C to C communication. Uh, and the analytic sophisticated methods, we move from these simultaneous metric systems to hierarchical Bayesian systems, where we get not only overall parameter estimates for sample advertising and promotion, but we get individual estimates of response and distributions across individuals. So this has been exciting. 50 years went by pretty fast. Uh, I'm amazed that every time, uh, every decade, new things come up and how surprising they are and how profound they are. So that gives you a little bit of my view of uh, 50 years here. Write down some notes yourself about what you think will be happening in the next 10 years, and we'll share those at the end of the talk. While you're doing that, I'd like to show you two examples of state-of-the-art work that we're doing. One is advertising morphing, and the other deep learning. So what's advertising morphing? Well, we know a lot about targeting. We know who to present our ad to. But in almost all cases, the ad we present is the same one we present to everybody else. And anybody who has ever been in personal selling or has studied social psychology or psychology knows that different people think in different ways and process information in different ways. So some people are very analytical. They want to take it apart. They want all the data. Other people, you know, don't confuse me with all those facts. Give me the overall picture. That's a dominant cognitive style, analytic versus holistic. And it drives the way we process information and respond. And if we're analytic and someone talks to us holistically, we kind of, uh, and if you're holistic and somebody gives you all those facts, you say, yeah, you're confusing me. So salespeople, for example, know when they go into a personal selling situation, they have to diagnose the cognitive style to know how to talk to this person. Is this a person who wants visuals or is this person who's verbal? Is this a person who's very impulsive, makes up their mind and goes? Or are they somebody that really want to think this over? That is so in style, impulsive, deliberative, visual, verbal. Are they rational, careful, rational thought? Or they're kind of intuitive. I go with my gut. Well, if you're trying to communicate to somebody who goes with their gut, it's different than if they're analytic, deliberative. So that's the motion behind morphing. Customize every ad to every person's cognitive style. Don't just target them. This is sort of how you talk to them once you've targeted them. So you still use all your old targeting technology, but now how should you talk to them? So here's an example of a study we did here at MIT for General Motors. And we created, as you'll see here, a set of ads on the left for the Avio. So for visual, kind of uh, non-analytic, Picture, sporty, fun, big headlines. For our visual with details, we have more pictures and hot links. If it's visual with no details, or with details, uh, we give up in print, we give a lot of data, a lot of crowding onto the screen or a website, and then visual details print again with combinations. So we created about 25 different versions of ads to match different cognitive styles. Now, is, how does morphing work? Well, what you have to do is know the cognitive style of the person on the other end of the web who's typing in. Well, the way you do that is you observe their click stream. 
And from their clickstream, you infer not uh, exactly what they're going to choose, but what their style is. So if they're looking at an auto site and they're drilling down deep about horsepower and technical specs, it tells you something about, oh, it might be more analytic. If they're looking at overall pictures and style, more visual. So you try to collect a long click stream, and then we model how that click stream infers their cognitive style. So this is a little sub-routine, a Bayesian inference process, where we take a small sample, measure the cognitive style by a battery of psychological tests, and build a model that shows how their clicks link to their cognitive style. Then we observe the clicks in the population, and we use that inference model to infer their cognitive style. And then we serve up the ad we think matches, and we observe the results. Now, these ads are served up individually, real time, and we read the results of those ads in terms of click-throughs or conversions. And then we use machine learning, uh, in this case, something called Gittin's index, to optimally design the adaptive experiments and identify the best ads for the best cognitive styles. So a big leap analytically, but it's driven by a very behavioral important phenomenon. So for example, in this uh, General Motors study, we did a controlled pre-post measurement test control. And you can see on the left on the control, after you showed people ads in the control, which are not matched to cognitive style, there was a positive response to, increase, to consideration. 35% would consider Chevrolet. When we matched the cognitive style, for, those, for a sample of people, instead of just the average ad, the uh, consideration rate was up 24%. So that was a pretty significant uh, indication, but albeit a survey result. So then we did a study, uh, it was sponsored by Google and WPP here at MIT, with CNET and AT&T, uh, particularly looking at uh, what morphing could do in the market so in this case, we're going to go in the market, do an A-B test where we match in the B condition, the cognitive style, and the A we don't. So again, we start with the data collection, a small survey to build the inference model. Then we go online on CNET, collect clicks, estimate cognitive style, target with our dynamic uh, adaptive experimentation, and then measure the click-through rates. So this is for... Uh, smartphones, and again, you can see as you look across the ads, if they're deliberative, there's a button for learn more. If they're holistic, there's very little stuff. If they're analytic, there's a lot of detail and hot links. And if you're impulsive, there's a get, get it now kind of button. Again, we had about 12 different ads to match combinations of different styles. We had 27,000 users, so now we're not talking about a survey, but a really substantial market experiment 63,000 sessions, and the click-through rate in the test was 0.25% to the uh, active button and 0.13 on the control. So in this experiment, it showed that matching cognitive style almost doubled the click-through rate for those banner ads. So that implies a kind of an encouraging result for the notion of making sure you not only target the right people, but to communicate to them in the right way. Now, we also did this uh, for websites. This is a British telecom website and a project they sponsored where they morph the website as a function of your cognitive style. This is broadband, so people who were analytic got lots of technical detail, lots of alternatives. Got, they were, they were visual, they got graphs. If they were holistic, they got general information, less content, and they could, if they were uh, verbal, they got audio instead of visual. Finally, just an example, this is a study in Japan, the Saruga Bank, and it's a card loan site where you select and make decisions about a card loan. And this is kind of the analytic version, deliberative. We also had one that's very simple graphics for uh, holistic and impulsive. In all these other studies, we were not able to do market experiments. We did very controlled pre-post test control surveys of over 1,000 people in each. And the average across those studies was a 20% increase in the consideration for the British telecom broadband or the Saruga loan cards or the general GM uh, autos. So uh, significant leverage 
if you can move your strategy now from targeting to matching individually and using machine learning to optimize the learning and adaptive behavior. So what's the future of morphing? Well, I think this is just emerging. Uh, we've got some market experiments going on with some client companies. Uh, it's pretty easy to use now. You do have to create alternative creative copy. So that usually brings the marketing web manager in contact with the advertising agency looking at creative strategy. This is much more than A-B testing. We're not changing formats and headlines. We're really changing communication strategy and how we talk to people. So it does require some real uh, marketing input, web input, and creative advertising input. Uh, we're working now to look at how this can be done across media. So your mobile cognitive style will match your web cognitive style. Uh, maybe even as TV gets more targeted or you're watching TV on the internet, we'll be able to make a uniform cognitive presentation to you of our brand across all those media. Uh, this, of course, brings up a lot of privacy concerns. Do, do I really want uh, P&G to know my cognitive style? Uh, well, if, if they ask me if I want to opt in and the promise is that they will communicate to me in a way that's most effective, I could do that. Or at least, I have to guarantee privacy. So this is a kind of an evolution from our current 2015 kind of world into 2016. And we'll move on as we go into the next decade, I think, as a way to communicate better to build trust. All right. Uh, so sec second state-of-the-art example. And then we'll come back to the, last, the next 10 years in your views. So, uh, deep learning. Uh, have any of you used deep learning in your marketing analytics yet? Well, you will probably if I ask that question in five years, many of you will have your hands up. So what's deep learning? Well, you may remember uh, Go, the game Go. It's uh, exponentially harder than chess. And it was one of the things that people said, you're never going to program a, a computer to beat the world's experts in Go. But this fall, AlphaGo, a program, beat the world champion Go player four out of five games. And this was done through deep learning. So this is uh, a whole new kind of analytic approach. And this project that I'm going to describe really kind of looks at what's the potential for deep learning and marketing analytics. Now we're talking big data, because deep learning works on big click streams. We're building AI in as kind of the next step it's a subset of machine learning. And you've seen a lot of success not only in Go, but voice recognition is driven by deep learning, handwriting recognition, visual recognition. These are all deep learning applications. And Google, with their DeepMind subsidiary, is leading the way and pushing this through on the, on the internet today. So we're going to see very rapid technical advances in that area. My question is, can we use it in marketing analytics? For example, can we target better? Can we morph ads better? Can we create new products better? Can we build better decision support systems? Well, to do that, we have to understand a little bit of what deep learning is about. And I'm going to introduce to you kind of our research initiative here, the Initiative on the Digital Economy, which has a major platform element. You can see four platform areas, uh, employment and productivity through technology, data, and privacy, new business models like platforms, and then the section I work with, uh, social dynamics and marketing experimentation, we have this initiative on deep learning. And you'll also see an initiative on behavioral storytelling from Renee in the next section. Uh, that's with foundation, individual, and corporation support. And what I'm going to describe to you is something sponsored by Saruga Bank on deep learning. And these are good examples of what I think Carl indicated is MIT really works off of relationships between companies, MIT faculty, and students. So uh, what's deep learning? So you have this kind of mystique. You know, it solves Go. It can solve everything. Well, it can't solve everything. And the best way to think about it if you're in marketing is that this is a new way to model the dependent variable, which could be choice, consideration, or attitude change. Now, previously, we used regression, for example. We used sales. We regress against advertising and promotion. Well, regression is a subset 
of deep learning. In fact, you can replicate regression by a special set of assumptions in deep learning. So think of deep learning as a super technique to understand relationships between observable marketing variables and response. It's predicting a response. So how does this uh, differ from linear regression? Let's think a little bit. So it, in a linear regression, you have a lot of input variables predicting a dependent variable. Traditionally, say, advertising promotion predicting sales. In deep learning, you have a similar thing, except you have multiple levels between the original variables and the dependent variable. These are called hidden levels. They're neural networks, hidden neural network levels. And by putting those in, you have a lot of ways to latent model what's driving the response. If you have big data and powerful algorithms, you can estimate all the parameters by those little lines. And over on the left, you can estimate from regression the simple ones. So you're trying to model much more complex, uh, whereas the linear regression has a lot of analytics behind it, like maximum likelihood, statistical packages. It's very interpretable. You know what the input is. You know which one's linked to the dependent. In deep learning, you have an overall search method that searches out all those links. And it doesn't really tell you what's going on in the middle. It only tells you the beginning to the end. So it's not easy to interpret. But it does have amazing power to predict often very subtle behaviors. Uh, if you are a statistician and you look at that picture on the right, you're probably upset. You said, this is an over-parameterized model. Anybody can fit anything with that. And in fact, that's a definitional item in deep learning. It is over-parameterized. So how do they do it? They divide a database into three sections, a fitting database, a validation database, and a testing database. So you know in the fitting database you're overfitting the model. But you use as a criteria for the best model how well it predicts on the validation data. So it's not how well it fits and its statistical properties. It's how well it predicts on new data. And if any of you have been doing as many regressions as I have over the years, you know that very few regression studies actually do predictive tests. They're almost all fit R squares and significance. So deep learning has a fundamental different philosophy. It's prediction, what predicts best, not what fits best. And after you've done the validation, you go to a clean set of test data, and you do it only once you test. And if it works, you're done. If not, you go get new data and start over. So it's a, quite a different technique, but it has some similarities. Uh, whereas in regression, we push the button and we do least squares or maximum likelihood. In deep learning, you have a very complex surface across those, for example, 50 parameters. And you're searching across that space to find the minimum error in the fit that you hope is going to predict the best. So you have a search algorithm. And it's, it's called the steepest descent. And much of deep learning is around what are the technical characteristics of the gradient descent methods. Because you want to make it efficient, and you don't want to get caught at a little local maximum. So different methods. So just kind of review classical statistics, the emphasis on the error term, the assumptions, you know, heterogeneity, autocorrelation. Statistical properties, whereas deep learning is, it works. It, be, it wins and go. It identifies an image. It tells you what one marketing variable one does for sales. Uh, this kind of regression approach is very simple and interpretable. It uses theory. Uh, neural nets are much more complex and are driven less by understanding as by usefulness. Uh, in regression studies, you kind of select a clean database. In deep learning, you tend to use very large databases. I have a graduate student who's doing work on a Citibank database of 500 million click streams. 500 million. You now need not CPUs, you need GPUs. GPUs are the next generation of computing speed. Uh, so you can see they're kind of different heritage but they do have some, com some relationships, statistical versus artificial intelligence, custom data versus low-cost big data. And one final uh, 
difference I might indicate. If you have complex databases, and I've represented this graphically on the top as colors, if that's two axes and each color is a different, say, product or response, what happens in regression is you kind of divide the area into linear segments. But in deep neural networks, it's nonlinear. It kind of tries to model the spiral of it. So you're really trying to look for these second order phenomena through the hidden layers, not the simple push-pull. All right, so that's uh, maybe give you a little introduction. If you're interested in learning more about this deep learning, uh, there's a Coursera course by Professor Hinton here in artificial intelligence, who world expert on deep learning. Uh, would encourage you, if you want to kind of go back to your graduate school days and kind of dig in, it may give you a headache. It did me as I went through the lectures, but uh, there's 13 great lectures on exactly what deep learning is. And Google uh, uh, scholars have put out a manuscript on how to use deep learning. So Google deep learning uh, textbooks, and you'll see some of the new textbooks that tell you how to do this. It's not like you can buy a regression package anymore. You have to put together pieces. Uh, software is called Torch, that's lar largely used. And you can put these together and put, make your own deep learning. I'm sure the packages will come out soon, but if you want to have the lead, uh, I would suggest as you look forward, deep learning is going to be one of the techniques you're going to want to know. So what, do we, uh, what can we do with deep learning? So we asked the question, well, if we had click streams, would that tell us anything about what kind of new product to introduce? Like, would it help us with a credit card? You know, we got lots of credit card data. People apply for credit cards. They go on Credit Karma. They go on Lending Tree. What if we had all those click streams? Could we identify an opportunity for a new product? Well, if we could, that would be something we'd put into the fuzzy front end of our new product development process. That wouldn't mean we don't have to design it in detail and do pre-market testing and test markets, but it may identify gaps or dimensions that we can use to create new products. So we picked a, a product, credit cards, and we did two phases. And I'm going to describe both of them briefly. And they're, the second one's just hot off the press this week. Uh, the first thing we did was we say, well, let's, let's set up a synthetic database where we know the answers. So let's, let's create some pseudo customer click streams that reflect what we know are the opportunities. And let's see if deep learning can recover them. So that's just a kind of a structural validity test. Is this going to work? And secondly, let's look at some empirical data. So first, the synthetic data. Uh, in this case, we're using a neural network with two levels. And we're going to predict the attributes of the first choice credit card. So whether that be cash or miles for, for the bonus award, rewards, or what the APR rate is. And we're going to compare it to simple multinomial regression, where we have one no hidden layers, just one direct link of clicks and uh, product, customer attributes to the credit card attributes. So this is what the simulated uh, synthetic world looks like. We have click data that we generate from known rules. We're trying to predict relative importance of travel, reward, and cash back, interest rates, reward rates, and borrowing limits on credit cards. So how do we do this? Well, we generated the cl synthetic click data. And we know from those what the true choice of attributes are, because we use those to generate the data. We're going to use the neural network to predict the attributes that are important. And we're then going to compare them to see how well we recover them. So we had rules. For our hypothetical world, people in that world had clicks. They had expendable income, education, risk tolerances, some attitude variables. And we use those to, with given choice rules, attribute what attributes were chosen as first preference and what clicks would be made. So we put that into the neural network, fit the neural network, and then we try to, we know what the attributes of importance were from when we generate the data, we compare them to what the neural network predicts in the validation and test data. And what we find is 54% of the time, the deep learning 
algorithm predicted exactly all four of the attributes of the customer's known function. So that's pretty good. We're not talking about R squares of 1, 5, 10%. This is 54% predictive accuracy of the attributes that a given customer will uh, have as first choice. So that was encouraging. And we went on to look at empirical data. And thanks to Comscore, who some of you may know from your marketing reporting, has a panel of 55,000 people. And they load their own browser for those 55,000. So we get every click that they make on the computer. So we pulled 15 bank credit card sites. <clears throat> And in that database, so 50,000 people, 28 clicks per person, and 30% visited more than one bank site. We took variables for the cards. In this case, now as we're in the real world, there are about 45 cards, and there are about 80 variables. So APRs, introduction, duration of how long the introduction, ongoing rates, reward, amounts, miles, cash, specials, demographics, and the URLs that people entered across each of these bank sites. Now, just as an interesting aside, you don't have to make those URLs common across all the banks. You just put them in. And deep learning creates a layer and does that for you in the interim as it models the commonalities across those. It kind of develops a language layer of what people's URLs really mean. So uh, two levels in our model, 55% uh, of our data was for fitting, 25% for validation, 25% for uh, testing. And we ran these algorithms multiple times so that we could get a distribution on the test results. And what we found was quite, quite encouraging. 52% of the time, we, correct, we correctly predicted the attributes that would be first choice for the samples of people, 50,000 people. And it, it was better than Logit and much better than a baseline. So just to give a little technical here, so if you go on the left, that's a kind of a benchmark of the most frequently chosen card. So if you just predicted for everybody that they chose the card that's most popular, you would be correct about 30% of the time. If you did the multinomial logit, no hidden layers, you'd be right about 45% of the time. If you did deep learning, neural networks, you'd be correct about 58% of the time. And the distributions around those predictions you can see from the bootstrapping would indicate uh, deep learning significantly better than Logit and significantly better than the baseline. And then we tried the deep learning without the links, just the demographics and characteristics of the people. And you can see there's a significant difference. Uh, deep learning does much better when you add the clicks as well. Once you have this outcome from the model, you can simulate opportunities. So here's a very simple example. Three existing cards, cash back, rewards, rates, and interest rates. And the bottom is an opportunity card. Miles uh, for the rewards, 1.5% reward rate, generous, but not the highest, and a lower interest rate, 13.9. And we predict, based on the choice models from the neural network, that that could have a big potential, maybe 20% market share against that market of, of four cards. And if you have a cost model underlying this, the cost revenues you make by transactions, the costs for failures, you can model the profit. Uh, likewise, you could look for a card within a space, like cashback only, and get ideas for market share and profit. <clears throat> or you could take a specific card and say, who does it appeal to? <clears throat> so here you have. A hypothetical JetBlue card, and it appeals primarily to young people, 18 to 24, mid cre credit scores, uh, mid income, and mainly uh, in the Midwest. Finally, uh, you could take specific segments of the population and say, if I want to target, for example, high income California residents, what kind of card would I have to have? These are the most popular cards in that segment. You can simulate and add a new card. So uh, deep learning, what did we learn from all this? Uh, we think there's some encouraging results. We're in process. <clears throat> We're now going to add Credit Karma, NerdWallet, and search sites. 
Uh, we're going to do some technical extensions through more probabilistic models. And then we're going to look at other marketing problems. And lastly, we'd like to look at not only is it better than statistical methods, but is it better than custom market research methods that may be costly, like conjoint. So uh, exciting area. If you're interested in this kind of area, this is the kind of thing where ILP or the Initiative on the Digital Economy uh, can be a home for you to start to learn more about deep learning. We need um, marketing problems. We need data. And we appreciate funding. So uh, our last item, uh, what's the next 10 years? So, so here are a few thought ideas I've had. But I'd be interested. We're going to have about 10 minutes for questions and look ahead. Uh, think about what you would see as the changes in customer dynamics. We're certainly get, getting saturated markets. There's a question of whether we're ever going to return to the 60s of growth markets. Is this going to be a low growth, 2% growth global world? Uh, we do know we're going to get a lot of volatility, preferences, economics, geographics, new media. Virtual reality is just striking. You know, what is uh, video quote TV, but video ads, video stimuli going to be like with virtual reality? How much more powerful will storytelling be if you're in virtual reality versus watching a flat screen? Uh, all these things are going to be C to C, customer to customer driven. Brands are going to have to cope with a world where they have very little control. And then we have new technology, new data. I mean, blockchains are going to happen, robots, automated driving. Kind of next 10 years kind of hold out as much excitement as the last 10 years. So we're going to need more innovation for companies to make profit opportunities. We're going to have some new tools, more powerful, GPUs instead of CPUs. Uh, we need new models, and machine learning, deep learning probably can help. And we are going to have to make sure these are simple enough so managers can make them useful and make uh, better decisions and more profit. So in summary, and then we'll break to questions, uh, this has been an exciting 50 years being here at MIT. And I must say, I'm still learning. And uh, I think there's a lot more to learn. Uh, I tell my marketing classes, you're very lucky. This is probably the most exciting time in marketing in the last 50 years. There are more discontinuities, but also more opportunities than any other. And one thing I learned in 50 years, and we probably all uh, are aware, is you really have to be ready for the unexpected. It's the things you don't expect that are going to happen. Uh, who would have expected 10 years ago YouTube and social media and virtual reality? And of course, this conference is going to look ahead. So I think as you go through the conference, you'll get a lot of ideas uh, pushing forward on those dimensions. So Tony, we got about <clears throat> eight or nine minutes left. Uh, we can do questions, or we can do next 10 years. Yeah, really good, <clears throat> really good question. I think there are two, two things here. One is what changes over time. And the other is, do you use a different cognitive style for different products? That I might be impulsive when I walk down and, and buy shampoo or toothpaste. But I'm probably not going to be as impulsive when I'm spending a lot of money like a car. So it's very useful to get this first phase of morphing, where you collect cognitive styles for a particular product, linking a particular click stream. I think some people have commonalities across all. But I would expect uh, for riskier products, they're going to be more deliberative. They're going to be more analytic. Now, there may be somebody for even deliberative products, a big price stock, who want to escape and just go with their gut. So it, it's an empirical question. I definitely uh, think you can kind of build the analytics because you're doing real-time experimentation to do that. Uh, changes over time, uh, same kind of thing. You can map changes over time. You don't just experiment once and say that's the solution, you can keep experimenting. And so you adapt over time to changes. As people maybe get more optimistic about the economy or less optimistic, they may change their style. But I do think the cognitive, cognitive style psychologists tell you is, is quite enduring. It's quite a basic phenomenon. So there will be changes. But you know, think about the people you talk to and you work with. People have a pretty dominant style. Uh, 
political candidates definitely do. Well, we're certainly seeing a lot of uh, multiple use. I mean, even people who are watching TV are on their iPhone or their iPad communicating with other people. So uh, devices are, are actually going to be a mix of layers. Uh, probably some people are uniquely mobile, particularly millennials, or are probably more there, and they're not email, and they're not TV, and everything's driven there. Other people are layered with multiple devices. So I think you, as you look at you know, kind of morphing and experimentation, you have to experiment across the platforms and in combinations. And that's going to be, a, I think, a challenge over the next 10 years because uh, we're pretty good on one media, it, but it's much more difficult when you go across websites to interactive TV to a virtual reality device or a mobile device. What do you think is going to drive your career over the next <clears throat> 10 years in terms of customer dynamics? What's, what's going to be the big change you have to cope with? Don't, Don't say no change, though. <laughs> trust with the consumer so that they are comfortable with the fact that brands know more about them. I feel like that is a big challenge to figure out how to do that in a way that you bring the consumer along the journey. Yeah, I agree. It, trust is really an enduring phenomenon. I mean, it came up about when the internet happened. Uh, I did some work uh, a couple years back on what I call benevolent apps, apps that help people make better decisions, not apps that just tell you where to buy your product. So we're developing the apps like Towboat USA, where they give you information on tides, safety tips. They give you free chart plotters, which seems counterintuitive because they deal with accidents. So you should have people make accidents, not safe. But you do it to be safe because safe means benevolence. I care about you. And then if I trust you, then I might be the kind of person, Towboat US, yeah, you can use my cognitive style. But if I sense you're trying to push me or trying to do something that's not straight, like you're using my data inappropriately, or you know something about me that I didn't tell you, that's a trust buster. And I think we really have to understand how all these new media relate to trust, because it really is that, particularly when the brand doesn't have the power anymore, trust is the way the brand succeeds. And that's, of course, what branding is all about, is trust. Easy question, huh? Yeah, well, <laughs> uh, I think the, you know, the conspiracy theory kind of notion are out there. And you, that, that extreme, the complete false news that was, we saw in the last campaign, two things that are just exaggerated or not factual. Uh, there is truth out there. I personally kind of think that we will develop trusted sources that become validated over time. I and mean, they probably won't be print, but they may be New York Times. And that is a big challenge going forward. Um, brands, I mean, politics is a big issue, but in brands also, you have conspiracy theories about your brand and products that are not right. Uh, long time over this last 50 years, we were worried about rumors. And there was a time when there was a rumor that McDonald's hamburgers had worms in them because they put worms in to lower the cost of the product and it wasn't cared for. And so th this is not a completely new issue, how to deal with misinformation. But if you have that trust we were talking about, you can enter information to your base and they will believe you. But if you don't have the trust and you try a counter argument, you're gonna have much more difficult things.
<clears throat> well, this is kind of push advertising versus benevolent advertising. Uh, I remember back to these auto cases when I was arguing for trust, you should show competitively your car against other cars. And they said, you mean honestly? <laughs> uh, I said, yes, because customers are going to know. I said, you know, what car would you recommend for your mother? Do you really have the best car for a senior citizen? Well, maybe, maybe not. I said, well, that should say, say something. You should make the comparisons. And if you don't have the best product, then you better build it because people will find out. So I think a lot more ads that have truth and comparisons and help people make decisions may be a key to getting around some of those issues. Uh, the kind of push ad you know, has that effectiveness of you know, make it happen, but that sounds to me like the 60s. That's when I came to MIT. We should be on trust and benevolence and helping people make better decisions and have genuine brands and real truthful brands, real innovative brands that have value. Thank you, Okay.